He's a man who's not here to just talk about the past. He's not here to just talk about the present. He's here to talk about how to fix the future. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Keane! Hi, everyone. I've got a timer here, so I'm going to stick to this table. Very nice to be here. Um, I have to dis uh, it was a very nice introduction. I have to disagree, though, with one thing about what the gentleman said at the beginning. Events like this aren't just about the audience. Because if they were, you wouldn't, we wouldn't have this division. I wouldn't be standing above you. Um, and you wouldn't need to come to events like this. You could stay at home in your, in your underpants, as maybe people watching do. I think one of the problems, actually, over the last 25 years with the digital revolution is that we've believed it's always about the audience. We've heard this, and I'm not just picking on this, you hear it at every event, every magazine, every entrepreneur will always say the same thing. It's all about you. It's all about you. And of course, it hasn't always been about you, which is the problem. That, I think, more than anything else, is why the future is broken, why the digital revolution hasn't, so far at least, worked out. So when you say it's all about you, it's all very well, and it's a nice thing to say, and it makes everyone feel good about themselves. We all smile. But ultimately, in a world which is supposedly all about you, we have, as I shall explain, surveillance capitalism, radical inequality, growing technological unemployment, online incivility, digital addiction, and so on and so forth. So it's all about you isn't enough. We need to perhaps think of a new catchphrase for the revolution uh, if we're going to make it successful. So some of you may know, some of you may know my previous work. Uh, over the last um, 10 years, I've been warning about some of this stuff. I've written three books, uh, Cult of the Amateur, Digital Vertigo, and The Internet is Not the Answer in which I've been pointing this stuff out since 2007. At first, I was sort of positioned as this reactionary, which politically I'm not, actually. I'm certainly more on the left than the right, as someone who didn't get it, who was against young people, against digital, against democracy. Uh, but over the last 10 years, I think, a lot of, not all, but most of, or many of my predictions have actually come true. And there's a small group of us, myself, Nicholas Carr, Sherry Turkle, Jerome Lanier, a few others, who have all been essentially making the same argument. And now, actually, what we've been warning about, what we've been saying, is actually coming true. This year, for example, there have been two major books that have come out in the US, one uh, by Jonathan Taplin, a Los Angeles music producer, movie producer, friend of mine, called Move Fast and Break Things, which is a kind of political critique. Um, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of Silicon Valley, and one that's just come out this week by somebody called Franklin Foa, who was the editor of The New Republic, um, uh, about what he calls the loss of mind, this growing authoritarianism, indeed even totalitarianism. So I wouldn't say my time has come, but certainly some of the things that I've been warning about have come true and are increasingly pre preoccupying everyone. So rather than um, writing another book, basically repeating myself, saying all the problems with the digital revolution, I think in 2017, 2018, we've come to a new moment in the conversation. Rather than pointing out the problems, which are increasingly self-evident and consensual outside a few offices in Mountain View and Palo Alto um, and Cupertino, uh, the challenge now is to how to fix the future. The future is broken. It doesn't work. Jaron Lanier, in his last book, wonderfully said, I miss the future, meaning I miss the optimism about technology. I miss the promise of what it offers. So now the challenge is, well, how do we fix it? How do we reinvent the future? How do we make it exciting again? How do we make it more like utopia rather than dystopia? How do we make the future a place that we want our children to inhabit rather than we're terrified for them to inhabit? So I've written this book called How to Fix the Future, which is part policy, part history, part futurism. It's out um, 
early next year in February in the UK and the US, and there'll be a German edition later in 2018 and many other editions. So what I'm going to do is give you a kind of preview of my arguments in the book. This is one of the first times that I've actually spoken about the book publicly. It's done, it's finished, the last edits were um, given in a few weeks ago, so uh, time now is to talk about it. I'm going to start um, with a little video, slightly self-promotional, but hopefully get you in the mood. The best way to fix the future is for government to understand that we need to unleash innovative measures. How do we fix the future? The way to fix the future is by following the principles laid out in the U.S. Bill of Rights. If we want to fix the future, we need 318 million Americans looking toward their government in a transparent way. I think we can fix the future by making intelligent decisions. The way to fix the future is to read books. The way to fix the future is for technology companies to develop an ethics policy, a conscience, and if they don't do that quickly, then governments will probably do it for them. How to fix the future. How to fix local journalism. Advertising is not going to work. How to fix the future. We need to find ways to continue to incentivize people to invest. You can't fix the future until you fix the present. Through better communication, we'll be able to fix the future. How 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 to fix the future. Well, I think the great thing about the future is that it's always in the process of fixing itself. It's, it's, it's a self-fixing thing. However, it could use a little help from time to time. And I think that's where somebody like Andrew Keane comes in with little fun suggestions about how we can do better. Well, thank you very much, Spencer. Um, very nice of you. So. Overall, I think, if we wanted to conceptualize what's gone wrong, I think we have a crisis of agency. I think what this means is that, let me, um, a crisis of agency meaning that we've lost control of the technology that we thought we'd invented for our own purposes. Of course, this is most um, eerily, troublingly, scaringly manifested in AI. Uh, my book, for the most part, isn't about AI, because AI, in many ways, is just an idea, uh, or it's many ideas. As John Borthwick uh, from Betaworks, one of New York City's best uh, uh, incubators, said to me, and I interviewed him for the book, um, we, don't, we don't know. We, in fact, he, he put it rather stronger than that. He said, we, uh, we, we don't have the, 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 a fuck of an idea of what AI is, but we know what it is, and most of us have an idea in our heads of smart machines, smart cities, smart cars, smart devices. We all have one of these. We all have an image of what a, a self-driving car is. We all understand, some of you are probably entrepreneurs in the Internet of Things space or the smart cities space, smart medicine, smart devices, smart bodies. But what, of course, the crisis of agency is bound up in is that whilst our machines, the technology all around us is getting smarter, we aren't. In my book, I go around the world talking to experts, finding out how they think about the things. I go all over the world from Estonia to Singapore to India, Germany, Brussels, East Coast and West Coast of the US. One of the most interesting people I talked to was a guy in New York City called Dov Seidemann. He is what Thomas Friedman calls him his teacher. He's the CEO of an ethical consultancy called LRN in, in, um, in New York. He's a very smart guy, very wise man, a real thinker. And in this industry, there aren't many thinkers. And he said, there's no Moore's law for morality. There's no Moore's law for humanity. And of course, we all know Moore's law, Gordon Moore of Intel's law about computer chips doubling their power every 18 months. We know that's the foundations, the engine of this great digital revolution. But as everything around us is changing, we're not. If we were back here in 1965, when Gordon Moore came up with his idea, we would be the same. Some of you might, have, uh, some of you might be wearing suits might be less facial hair, but basically we'd be the same. Our brains haven't changed, our mentality, our consciousness. So all this stuff around us is changing. 
more and more smart machines, smart companies, smart devices, but we aren't. So this technology seems to be getting ahead of us. It's happened before, of course. It happened in the middle of the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. It's happened many times in history. I think one of the things to underline, at least in my view, is that the crisis or the challenge facing us isn't unique. Some people will say, and some people might even say it in, 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 in this uh, event, we've never lived through a moment like this in history. This moment is unprecedented, a unique moment in human history. I guarantee you one thing about the people who say that. They know absolutely nothing about history. They haven't read a history book. Because every generation, or certainly every century or two, has a great new technology, which digital is, like the industrial technology. But it's not unprecedented. It offers the same challenges of governance, of social challenges, and political challenges, and cultural challenges that previous technological change has had. So we have a crisis of agency in broad terms. What, of course, we're falling into is a surveillance economy. I've been making this point now for over 10 years. Now it even has a name. Someone came up with the notion of the dominant players in this economy, Facebook and Google in particular, uh, companies that are almost worth a trillion dollars. Uh, I think Google now is the most valuable or the, 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 the highest cap company in the world. Facebook's in the top five. Remarkably powerful, remarkably brilliant and successful companies. But they're all based, of course, on surveillance. They all give out their products for free. We use Google a million times a day. I use it probably two million times a day. We're all on Facebook, or most of us. I'm not. It's too boring, too annoying. But most of How many of you are on Facebook? Better question, how many of you aren't? Oh, okay, well, I hope there's more of you in, in a few years. And not to be on Facebook requires a conscious decision. It's not like, oh, well, I forgot to be on Facebook. It requires you to say, I don't want to be on this thing. It's annoying. It's, 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 it's intrusive. It's a waste of time. But of course, these companies are premised on giving away their remarkable products for free and then turning us into their product and selling us to advertisers. So what we have is this surveillance economy where we, the audience, or whatever we want to call ourselves, have become the product, and we are the one who are being mined. Everyone talks about data being the new oil. Well, you are the oil. You're sticky. You, someone's been digging you out of the ground, and they've become very rich doing so. So we have a surveillance economy, which is a huge problem. It's the core business model problem of this new economy. We have increasingly the dark cloud of technological employment. Now, someone will stick up a hand and say, well, look at the last employment figures. They weren't so bad. It's true. In the short term, of course, employment is not challenging. In the US, I think unemployment and in the UK, unemployment rates are pretty small. I don't know what they're like in Switzerland. I would guess they're relatively small too. But in the long term, smart machines do away with jobs. They're replicating us. They're undermining us. Some Oxford economists, serious Oxford economists, made a report a few years ago suggesting that 47% of people would be unemployed in the next 20 years through smart technology. Now, I don't quite know how they get to 47%. We know these reports are speculative, and we know that it's still unclear. There's a huge debate now about the economists. But I spoke to a number of economists in my book, and they're all worried. They all worry that this new technology whether it's smart algorithms and machinery in fast food restaurants or in law offices or in hospitals or uh, in publishing houses, more and more of this technology is replicating human labor. It's making us redundant. Again, it's core to this idea of agency. Silicon Valley inequality. I don't need to talk to you about this. I think if you add the top nine wealthiest tech people in Silicon Valley. I have the numbers in my book. It comes out to something like the, the, their, their combined uh, wealth adds up to something like 20% of the world's, uh, uh, the, the world's wealth. So 20% of the people in the world are worth nine, uh, nine uh, about the same as what Bezos and Zuckerberg and Page and Brin and one or two others at work. Now, that doesn't mean these people are immoral. It's not their fault they've become so rich. You can't blame Jeff Bezos for being worth 70 or $80 billion. 
You can't blame Larry Page or Sergey Brin. They're brilliant young men, and they've done what everyone's allowed to do in capitalism. They've gone out, built remarkable products and companies, done it legally, and become very rich. They're not bad people, but the system, there's something wrong with the system when you have such radical inequality, and you see it in a microcosm in Silicon Valley. Some of you have been there. It's increasingly, and in Europeans understand this, it's increasingly a feudal landscape. May not have the castles and the knights, and unfortunately the etiquette of the medieval period, but it's got everything else. And indeed, the new campuses of companies like Apple and Google reflect medieval castles cut off from the outside. We have, of course, a cultural crisis. It's increasingly becoming evident. We were told that the doing away with gatekeepers would be a good thing. It would give the audience, it would give everyone an opportunity to speak for, for themselves. It would result in what we've called the democratization of media. Big media, elite media, biased media would be done away. But of course, what we've done by doing away with the gatekeepers is we've allowed people like Vladimir Putin and his um, anonymous troll factories in Moscow to take over. So what we have is an increasing uh, plague of fake news, of unreliability, of a crisis of truth. This digital revolution then hasn't benefited our culture. It's a bad thing for our culture. Most of us are feeling increasingly pessimistic. Now, that doesn't mean we trash our devices. That doesn't mean we go back to reading newspapers. Of course, we can't do that. I'm not in reactionary, and my book isn't a reactionary tone. We can't wind the clock back, but at the same time, we can't just stand back and say, okay, whatever will be, will be, because that's part of the problem. That's the crisis of agent. Incivility. I think the, it's not only incivility, it's addiction. Many of you have kids. You know how tied they are to these devices, how addicted they are. The tone, the, the tone of our discourse has declined over the last 40 years. Now, we might be polite to one another at events like this. There's a great deal of civility in person. But when it comes to our digital media, when it comes to the revolution, most of us are increasingly lacking civility and generosity. We see a huge rise in bullying, in racism. And it's probably no coincidence, although the cause and effect pieces are complicated, it's no coincidence that the digital revolution and the undermining of central cultural authority has resulted in the rise of increasingly xenophobic, uncivil politicians like Donald Trump and the Brexit vote in the UK and the political turn to the right in Hungary and Poland. Now, I know Switzerland is slightly outside this, but then, of course, Switzerland's always outside things. That's your strength and weakness. That's the reason to be here and probably to leave as well. Uh, Switzerland has always been this island of civility surrounded by uh, the Huns and the, and the other uncivil people. So I'm sure Switzerland's fine, but I'm afraid to report that the rest of the world isn't. There's a lot of other things I could go on. If you really want to read about the crisis of agency, read my last book, The Internet is Not the Answer. So how do we fix this? Now, I think the important, you, if you had a technologist up here, they would come up with some clever technological fix, right? Someone would have the nerve, I would shoot them if I could, not shoot them, of course, but metaphorically shoot them. Um, someone would say, well, there's an app to fix all this. There's this service, there's this online network, there's this community, there's this self-driving car, there's this AI company, there's this open platform. And you will have people saying that. And for the most part, they're wrong. It doesn't mean that what they have is completely wrong. It doesn't mean that every new piece of technology is bad. It doesn't mean that every startup is trying to be the new Facebook and Google and essentially exploit us and rip us off. But it does mean that we need to get out of the mentality of thinking that the answer to the digital revolution is more digital technology. That the answer, if you like, to the overload of technology, to having too much technology, is more technology. So 
in my five pillars, I don't include technology for the most part. Or certainly, the pillars in terms of a solution aren't technological. That does not mean, however, that technology plays a role. Again, it's very important for me, for my own, I guess, personal vanity and credibility, to underline the fact that I'm not a Luddite. Because all too often, this debate falls into the kind of techno-utopian Luddite dichotomy. While either someone says, oh, you're a techno-utopian, you have no idea of the real world. Or you're a Luddite, you want to go back to the cave, you want to go back to using candles, you want to go back to the horse and car. And the reality is that we need to get beyond that debate. There are a few techno-utopians out there, although the reality is most of them who made a fortune peddling their ideology 20 years ago have disappeared. Look at somebody like Chris Anderson, the former editor of Wired, who wrote all these books that were entirely wrong, like The Long Tail and Free, and now he's disappeared. Um, and people like myself have become perhaps a little bit more realistic, a little less reactionary, a little bit more open to technological innovation. So we need to find that middle area. Go back to the Industrial Revolution in the middle of the 19th century, which I do in my book. There were, of course, those who believed that if you just leave everything alone, we'd get to a utopia. Ironically enough, those people combined, those were people, a, a combination of radical Marxists who believed that, to use Marx's or Hegelian Marx or Hegel's famous phrases, if you just let history unfold itself, you'd get to this grand synthesis, this final moment where it all be free and happy, which of course is anything but happened. And then you had the free market capitalists. But most people were somewhere in between. You also, of course, had the reactionaries, the conservatives, who wanted to destroy the factory, who wanted to destroy the machinery. But most people, business people, labor people, ordinary citizens were somewhere in between. I think we need to introduce five pillars, five strategies. There is no easy solution. We're living through a great moment in history, just as we lived through a great moment in the 19th century. There was no simple solution to the challenges and opportunities of the Industrial Revolution, and the same is true today. So what I've done in the book is created these five pillars. Sounds rather phallic, I'm afraid. I'm not quite sure. There's probably a better word than pillars. Five principles, five ideas to build my arguments around. Five ways of thinking about fixing the future, which aren't new. One of the things I stress in my book is there are no new strategies. We've done this before, and we will do it again. We've lost control of our agency before. We've been overcome, overpowered. We've been threatened with being turned into footnotes of history. And we've turned the page upside down. We've governed the technology rather than the technology governing us. And we've always done it in the same way. The first is through government. Now, again, in Switzerland, this won't come as a great shock to you. This is a very well-governed country, although I have to note, having driven through it the last few days, that your roads could be improved a little bit. I was trusted everything worked in Switzerland, but clearly you have some problems with your roads. Uh, I'm probably sounding too Californian now. Uh, throughout history, government has been critical. Government was critical in the 19th century. We need regulation. Not reactionary regulation, but regulation that enables innovation. Now, if I said this in Silicon Valley, I'd already be booed off the stage. It accused me of being a, you know, a totalitarian or some other silly thing. The reality is, though, that government regulation is key to all this. Of all the things, it's probably the most important. And we're increasingly seeing the role of government in shaping this new economy. It was particularly true in the Industrial Age. Remember, in the Industrial Age, had you not had government regulation, we'd still have 11-year-olds in factories. We'd still have cities that were uninhabitable. We'd still have such disparities of wealth between the factory owners and the workers, um, who, by the way, would be mostly unemployed, that, 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 that would, would, would make the, the, the current inequalities between Silicon Valley and the rest of the world seem inconsequential. Competitive innovation. It's very important to note that you've got to have innovation here. We can't fall back just on government regulation. 
but we need new kinds of innovation. We need the kind of innovation that will result in long-term benefits and actually benefit the audience, not just a few clever technologists in Cupertino or Palo Alto or Mountain View. Innovation, then, is key. But the, it's important to note, as we shall see, that there's not only one way of thinking about innovation. It's not just the free model. There are many other business models. So entrepreneurs are really important. Technological entrepreneurs are really important. That doesn't mean that one single app will solve the future. But the market is nonetheless key. Some people will say, um, and you increasingly see this argument being made, particularly by uh, academics in the United States and the, and, and, the, and, and the UK, that this enables what Paul Mason, who's a good writer, who I think is wrong, calls a post-capitalist future. Post-capitalism is dystopian. We don't want post-capitalism. We want a better capitalism. We want an improved capitalism. We want an capitalism 2.0. But the idea that digital can do away with capitalism, create some sort of digital communalism, is a mistake. It was a, make, a mistake 30 years ago, and it's a mistake today. And whilst people have fallen into that trap and have fallen in love with it, of course, we've had anything but digital communism. We need social responsibility by citizens. Everyone has a role to play here. As a labor unionist, as a parent, we need to take control of our own lives. Now, some of you say, well, what can I do? You can do a lot. You can write. You can blog. You can influence your friends. You all have jobs. You're investors. You're entrepreneurs. In my book, I invent a new concept. Uh, rather than Moore's Law, M-O-O-R-E, I come up with an idea called Moore's Law, M-O-R-E, named after Thomas Law, the 16th century English uh, author of Utopia. And as I argue in the book, the, the moral foundation, the whole point of writing Utopia is to imagine a better world and to get people to imagine it too. So even being here, thinking about these issues, having an open mind in our white room is a good thing. Citizens are key. If we just give all the responsibility to government, to entrepreneurs, to Silicon Valley, we're lost. You all have roles, parents, unionists, leaders of one kind or another, teachers. You need to act. We're living through a great moment in history, and we need to all act if it's going to be successful. Consumer choice is also really important. Um, it's, it's critical that con in consumer choice, uh, we shape the future as consumers. Now, we've done it in a mistaken way. We thought as consumers we were getting a great deal with Google and Facebook, but we weren't. There are other examples of other industries over the last 150 years where consumers have made a difference. I have a section in my book on the car industry in which consumers demanded safer cars and got it and actually crushed the U.S. car industry and, and made the European, particularly the German car industry, dominant. We've seen it the same with food, where consumers want better quality food, more organic food, higher, more nutritious, more, more, more beneficial for their children and, and for their health, and they got it. So consumers are important. Consumers are shaping the future too, not just as citizens, but as self-interested people. Finally, education is key. Now, Always at the end of these so-called pillars when someone comes up with how, how do we fix the future? Everyone always says, well, education at the end, and they shove it off to poorly paid teachers and say, well, just get the teachers, get the parents to teach the kids. That's too easy, of course. I have a final chapter on education, which I think is interesting, and it explores different kinds of education systems. But these five together are key. Think of them like a stack in a software world. They are independent, but also they connect with one another. Often things can't be simply separated into one of those five. But every solution throughout history, one way or the other, in our history, in terms of our relationship with technology and making the world a better place, has included one of these five pillars. I'm going to go through very, very quickly. 
I'm not going to go over each of them, um, but I'm just going to broadly, because I, I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, as always, I'm behind. Um, these are the government regulations that I get into in my book. Antitrust is really important. I have a chapter in Brussels. Re labor regulation, particularly in terms of the sharing economy and the rights of what we call the precariat in this new labor world. We need the role of lawyers. We need new rules which protect this precariat, protect part-time workers. We no longer live in a world where people work full-time in factories. As a Swiss man, actually, Daniel Strauss, who one of the, the founders of your uh, movement for creating a, a, a minimum wage, a guaranteed minimum wage, said to me, uh, in the future we'll all have eight jobs, which is true. Many of our kids will grow up having eight or ten jobs, but they still need protection from the market. Um, we need new laws about treating internet companies, again, particularly Google and Facebook, like media companies, holding them responsible not allowing them to get away with murder as they have done for the last 20 years, and crushing independent media, becoming increasingly powerful and monopolistic. Antitrust is, of course, really important in that way, too. We do need a guaranteed minimum income. You guys in Switzerland are leading the way on that. I have a few pages in my interview in Zurich with Daniel Strauss. Now, I know that it got voted down. By the way, how many of you voted for the guaranteed minimum income in your last referendum? Now, how many of you voted against? Most of you didn't vote. I thought it was illegal in Switzerland. I thought it got put in prison or something. No? Sorry. Uh, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. And we need, of course, the protection of public space, digital public space. We need a new world. Just as we have parks and places to meet in the physical world, we need it in the digital world too. And we need the government to underwrite that. Again, we're not talking about Stalinism or digital socialism or any of these things. But these are the key areas where government is key. When it comes to competitive innovation, we need new business models. We're already seeing that. New ways of thinking about products, where people pay for their products rather than being turned into the products themselves. We need to reinvent the so-called free economy, because it isn't free. And it's increasingly catastrophic. And if we allow it to, uh, allow it to continue much more, then it's going to result in a, in a new kind of digital totalitarianism. We need innovation mixed with regulation. We have in the EU, and I know you're kind of a little, little bit like a Britain in terms of your relationships with the EU, but you have a, a data protection, a new data protection law coming in next year in the EU, which will reinvent opportunities for entrepreneurs. Now, some people will say it's against innovation, this kind of regulation, but it doesn't. It actually enables startups we're at a bad time in the history of innovation, where a tiny group of companies are dominating everything. New regulation will change that. We need ethical entrepreneurship. That doesn't mean giving away all your money, but it means thinking small, thinking differently. Not every startup needs to be a billion or a $10 billion company. That, of course, requires VCs as well to think small or to think smaller. In my book, I have a number of interviews with prominent VCs, John Borthwick in New York, Brad Burnham, and Albert Wenger from Union Square Ventures in New York. These are highly respected, highly successful uh, VCs who are all saying the same thing. We need to think smaller. That doesn't mean you give away your profits. It doesn't mean you collapse your VC funds, but thinking differently about investment and the size of companies. We need alternatives to the advertising model when it comes to content. The advertising model, as, as we saw in the video, it doesn't work. It's a failure. Just doesn't work. The advertising world is corrupt. It's arcane. Nobody understands it. It's dominated by trolls. So we need to rethink advertising, not only as an ecosystem in the digital economy, but also its central role in content. And, of course, as I said, we need new ways of thinking about growth. When it comes to civic responsibility, Moore's Law versus Moore's Law. We need to remind ourselves that we are masters of our own community, and the future will only be better if we make it so. It won't just happen. We need to learn from the past. We need to be inspired not just by Thomas More, who actually failed in many ways, was executed by his king, but from the Industrial Revolution, from 
labor activists, from people who struggled to make the world a better place, to new political coalitions and co constellations. We need to remind ourselves that we do have companions in this struggle. They just may no longer be alive. It's also a geographical world. As I stress in my book, there are models which we can follow now in terms of the creation, for example, of good digital governance. I spend a chapter in Singapore, a chapter in Estonia. I think Switzerland in many ways, I wish I could have had a chapter on Switzerland too. Switzerland is innovating in terms of digital identity and digital rights, but certainly Estonia and Singapore are leading the way with responsible politicians who are creating the antithesis of what's happening, for example, in Russia and China, which is a new kind of digital totalitarianism. You break it, you fix it. We need to remind Silicon Valley of that. There are people who understand that. But we need to remind the Zuckerbergs and Bezos, it's all very well giving away all their money and showy things to land on another planet or to solve what they claim to be uh, disease forever. But their real responsibility is learning from the past, learning from people like Andrew Carnegie, a 19th century philanthropist, and actually fixing what they broke. Carnegie understood that this capitalism was creating inequality and incivility in the 19th century, so he spent a huge amount of his wealth opening libraries to make people better educated, to give them a chance. I would like someone like Bezos, who's perhaps the most brilliant man in America at the moment, certainly in business terms, in, in many other ways, to really get his teeth into a substantial problem like fixing unemployment, to addressing these huge issues. The same with Zuckerberg. We'll see with Zuckerberg when he runs for president. Um, he has always impressed me, and he impresses me more and more. I think he's a very mature young man and ever maturing. So hopefully they're listening to this sort of thing. Rethinking labor, as I said. Rethinking what it means to be a worker. And, of course, rethinking leisure as well. An agency in technological leadership, which we've talked about. Very briefly, consumer choice, as I said. Whoops. Uh, mentioned. Uh, whoops. Um, we can act in lots of different ways. The delete Uber is the obvious one, where consumers discover that a, a new company is really bad, like Uber, which has become a kind of cartoon-like figure, and Travis Kalanick, an ex-CEO, a, a cartoon-like bad guy. But it's more than just that. It's more than just deleting our apps. That's fine, and it's a good thing to do. But we need to think of ourselves as powerful consumers. So we did that with food. We did it with cars. What should we be doing now when it comes to digital? What should we be doing now, for example, in the way that our kids are addicted to the internet? Should we, demand, should we be demanding ethical products? In my book, I, when it comes to design, in my book, I talked to someone like Trist, uh, I talked to someone called Tristan Harris, who is a um, an ethical developer. He did work for Google. He had the position of eth ethical philosopher or something at Google, which may have been slightly contradictory. But anyway, he left there and now is leading a nonprofit, focusing on getting software developers to sign a kind of a medical a, a medical like pact in which they're committed to creating better products. We need to demand that ourselves. In the middle of the 19th century, what the Industrial Revolution was giving us was shit, literally often. Bad food, bad product, bad housing, bad cities. The same is in many ways true of the digital world. We're being given these products which are by definition addictive, exploitative. We need to ask for more. That doesn't mean smashing our machines. It doesn't mean this digital Sabbath. It doesn't mean turning off. It means actually turning on. And finally, education, always final. I like the importance of the Swish initiative. I like, I think his name's Daniel Strauss, right? Uh, certainly his first name's Daniel. Uh, I, I had a, a lovely lunch with him last year. And what interested me, he was the pioneer of your guaranteed minimum income. What was interesting to me is he was a teacher. He worked for years in a Montessori school. He understood the need, the importance of leisure. And if indeed we are moving into a world where we don't all need to work, if indeed this smart technology will mean that in many ways we'll be replaced, we need 
better education. So the guaranteed minimum income is fine in itself, and many people are shocked, maybe with its economics or lack of economics. It's still a rather woolly idea. It's being pioneered not only in Switzerland, but in Finland and Brazil and Canada and many other places in the world. But the real challenge is not making sure that everyone gets their 1,000 or 2,000 euro or Swiss francs a month. The real challenge is what are these people going to do with the money? If they're sitting at home, if they don't have a job, it's great to get them out of factories. It's great maybe if they stop driving lorries or trucks or cabs. But they've got to do something. They're not just going to sit at home and update their Facebook or Twitter account. So the real long-term challenge is education. We need to rethink schools. We need to rethink the opportunities when it comes to Montessori and Waldorf, alternative schools, both founded not far from here, Montessori in Italy, Waldorf in Austria by Rudolf Steiner. And indeed, it's no coincidence that Daniel Strauss was a Montessori teacher. We need to be rethinking universities, the relationship between engineering and the humanities. In my book, I spend some time with a professor in Singapore who is creating an institution, a new university, which combines the humanities and engineering. It's not either or. We're not saying, well, let's all go back to reading Plato or let's all become programmers. We've got to be both. That's the sweet spot. And of course, most important in education, and particularly, I think, in uh, Waldorf-style education, we need to empower. Education is about creating individuals who are empowered, who are ready to take on the world. Education isn't an end, it's a beginning. So that's it. In short, I'm gone over a little bit, but um, can, we, can we take 10 minutes of questions? Where, where are the authorities here? Perfect, yeah, let's, let's, get, uh, let's open the floor up to questions. Thank you very much for that okay. excellent presentation. Thank you. All right. The first question. We'll do the classic raise your hands. First question. Don't disappoint me about... You, you have the chance of how to ask, you know, how to fix the future. I mean, this is a great chance. How many of you guys have solved the future already? So you guys should have questions. <laughs> All right, first question. I'm going to throw this in the middle, otherwise. Somebody can catch it. Don't be Swiss. All right, here we go. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, let, 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 it, it, maybe someone wants to ask a question about whether indeed the future needs to be fixed. Some of you may disagree. You may think I'm talking rubbish. That's, that's a good question. Is, is the future already fixed? Yes, we are. That actually, yes, please. Oh, this is the troublemakers upstairs, right? Yeah. They, they... <laughs> <laughs> is There's only good seats. Yeah, is there sorry. a cheap end in Switzerland? Is there a cheap end? I don't think so. No. <laughs> You're all wealthy, right? This is utopia. Go on. Um, that's a great question. Um, in my uh, section on government, I had antitrust. I think I had, a, I had the great fortune, actually, to have a, an hour meeting with Margaret Vestager here, who's the EU czarina of antitrust. She's the one who's gone out on a limb against Facebook and Google in particular, fined them several billion dollars for their antitrust. I think the reality is and this is why Europe is actually important. The initiative needs to come from Europe, not because Europe's better, but because America is so screwed up politically. It's become so dysfunctional, particularly at this moment with Trump and the collapse of the Republican Party and a, a general kind of ideological crisis and a, a crisis about what government is and what's the function of government. But the only... W the only place where antitrust is going to be led is Europe. And we're already seeing that. And I think that Vestager in particular needs to be applauded for taking on these monopolists, because clearly that's what they are. With Google, for example, I mean, being a monopolist, it's not illegal to be a monopolist. What's illegal is using your monopoly power in one sector to benefit another side of your business. And that's what they did in particular with the shopping site self-evident. I did an, uh, an event in Brussels a couple of weeks ago where even the Google lawyer kind of 
So what's interesting is that this is a very important role for Europe. One of, I think, and, and you said I'm pessimistic. I'm not pessimistic. I might look it, and I might sound it at nine in the morning, but I'm not. I'm actually <laughs> optimistic. This book is optimistic. It's saying we can fix the future. It's not all theory. I go out and talk to people like Vestager, and these are people who are actually solving the future. It's not all theory. In America, it's all theory. Oh, well, we need the FCC or the FTC or Trump or the Democratic Party or the Supreme Court. It's not going to happen. Nothing ever happens politically in America. America is amazingly innovative when it comes to business, but incre increasingly prehistoric or just completely dysfunctional when it comes to politics. So Europe is in many ways the answer here, and the rest of the world takes the lead from Europe. For example, uh, in Singapore, I met the equivalent of Vestager there, and he takes the lead. So just as in the, think of it in the Microsoft case. I use the analogy of Microsoft. 30 years ago, Microsoft was destroying competition. It was dominant. It was a remarkable company with remarkable technology and it, so on. But it wasn't good to be a startup because any, any innovative startup would either be acquired or crushed, often illegally, by, Facebook, by, by Microsoft. The same is true of Google today. And in, it was in the, Google, in, in the Microsoft case in the 90s, it was in many ways Europe that took the lead. So I'm strongly in favor of antitrust. Monopolies are bad. Peter Thiel, who's written a very, very different book from mine, says monopolies are good. Everyone should want to become a monopolist. Of course, an entrepreneur would want to become a monopolist. They'd control the market. But monopolists might be good. Monopolies might be good for the monopolist, but they're terrible for everyone else. They destroy innovation. They result in exploitation and poor products and bad pricing. That's why antitrust is so important, and that's why I think we should applaud Vest. Thank you very much for that first question. I think that's it for the there first question. There was one guy there. Oh, do we have one more? I'm sorry. Please. Let the downstairs. There's a, there's, a, there's a dice somewhere in there. I think I threw it somewhere in the middle. There you go. You can speak into the, the blue dice. Perfect. Nice. So um, you can hear me then? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, past industrial revolutions have made one skill or another obsolete, and uh, some sector of our working population uh, without jobs, and they've had to learn a new skill, uh, and eventually, or with some pain, have, have we've recovered from these revolutions. It seems like the difference when you have machine learning and AI displacing jobs is it's not dis displacing one skill or another, it's displacing skill itself. And so that means that whatever occupation is being displaced by today's machine learning, whatever I can retrain those workers to do, I can retrain the AI to faster and better. It's not, clear, it's not clear to me that, that yeah. education is the answer to that. Great question. So the beginning of the book, and this is, uh, this is a sort of summary, not only to the question, but the book presentation. The beginning of the book, I quote Ada Lovelace. How many of you know Ada, who Ada Lovelace? Well, she, was the, she was the daughter of Lord Byron. She's famous for that, but she's more famous as essentially the mid-19th century Victorian mathematician who invented uh, computer software. She was the business partner of Charles Babbage, who invented the physical computer. Babbage, probably because he's a man, has always got the, is, is, is more famous than Lovelace. But Lovelace is probably the most important figure in the history of computer. Um, and, and Lovelace in the middle, and I quote her, mid, Lovelace in the middle of the 19th century said something of great importance. She was talking about, she invented the idea of software. Before Lovelace, the idea of an algorithm. Before Lovelace, no one had even imagined what it was or could be. And she said, we can do all these things, but I, I, I can't, the quote is in the book, the great quote, I'm going to do it a disservice, but I'll try and generally summarize what she said. She said, we can, we can get computers to do everything, but we can't get them to think for themselves. We can't give them gold. So I think you're wrong in the sense that we can make computers do everything that we can do. We, do, we can get them to, to do many, many things. We can get them to drive a car. We can get them maybe to give this kind of lecture, maybe even to ask the kind of question you are, certainly to s serve fast food and figure out law cases and what's, what's wrong with someone. But what we can't do is firstly give them initiative, give them will, agency. 
which is the very thing that's the core of the book. And secondly, we can't teach computers the, the gray area, the gray area outside ones and zeros, the gray area outside the algorithm. So indeed, I think you're wrong. I think that the, the real opportunity is with training human beings to be more empathetic. The great challenge is not to get people to replicate computers. So some people say, get out all the kids to learn programming. I think that's a fatal error because most programming, in fact, all programming can be done or will be done by the AI. But we can't teach computers to be empathetic. We can't teach computers to exist between the algorithm and the patient, the algorithm and the client, the speaker and the audience. So the real, and, and this comes back to the question earlier about pessimism. The reason why I think I am optimistic is ultimately we're on our own now. If we're going to succeed in this new world, we have to be more human. So the new world will inevitably, unavoidably need to be humanistic because whatever that word means, and I get into it a little bit in the book, but whatever that word means, it's the opposite of what an algorithm can do. It's the opposite of what Ada Lovelace invented in the 19th century and is shaping the digital revolution. So I think education is key, but it's not formal education. It's not rote education. It's not learning things off by heart. That's why new kinds of education systems, Montessori and Waldorf, which brings out the human, which gets people to think for themselves, is so important. Sergey and Larry went to Montessori school. Now, we're not all going to become Sergey and Larry, which is probably good, but their initiative, their ability to take on the world and rethink the world is a model that I think we all need. So I do disagree with you. I think education is actually key but it's not formal education. It's not industrial education. We're not learning to become machines. We're learning to become unlike machines. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's it for the questions that we have f for you here today. And uh, hold on, guys, come up here. So we, we don't know how to solve all problems for the future, but if you happen to be walking around on Friday and you need to carry a few things around, we do have a solution for that. And, and here's a headset oh, wow. that'll tell you a little bit about the sound of the future. What I mean, a surprise. That's Thank what you. it sounds like. Thank Wonderful. you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming out here. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you.